Question number four. This is a statement here by Sheikh Muhammad al Taymin talking about the importance of this book. And like we said, this is what we're trying to achieve. You know, we don't just come and leave and we have a nice time. The whole point is that we are trying to <coughs> achieve something by the end of this. And what he has said is that it's an absolutely beneficial book to the heart of a person. And once, that, once it affects the heart of a person, Riyadh Salihin, it also encourages the reader to act with righteous deeds. And then he concludes his opinion by saying that this book is a book that must be studied, cannot be neglected. Okay, uh, like we did last week, I want to start off by asking you a question. Everyone says La ilaha illallah. Yeah? La ilaha illallah. Yeah. Everybody believes that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. I want to ask you a question. What are some of the things that you need to believe in La ilaha illallah? So, again, like we've said, you need a pen, you need some paper, uh, you need a mushaf eventually, even for this lesson. Uh, but let's start off with this. In your group, so give me a couple of minutes, but people are still coming in. Have a nice discussion. What do you need to believe in La ilaha illallah? Um, I would mention one thing. Like, I know that question was asked many times. I'm not sure if I'm still in the They say the first thing you need to have knowledge and what's that in the means. So that's, that's just one thing. But let's hear from you, brother. The beauty again. The best knowledge. Yeah, you need to be found. What's the evidence? Oh, Here we have the Shaykh. We mentioned the one thing that you need to have knowledge. What's the evidence? To understand things. Yeah, to understand things, isn't it? Again, what do you think about it? I'd say sincerity. Yeah, that's a good one. Class, yeah. I mean, that's a which is the best job to do. Have you got something down? That's a possibility. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, to have sincerity. And I think today always touch touch the today's message is truthfulness. You need to to have truth, isn't it? Submission and following. That's important. One more minute. What do we need? Application. Ah, truthfulness. Truthfulness. No problem. Question What do we need to believe in La ilaha illallah? Join any one of the groups. We can make your own group. You can make your own group. Yeah, one more minute, guys. What do we need? Conviction. Yeah. 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 So the first thing is that someone must have assistance of God. You yeah. need the assistance of God, okay? So you need, you need Tawfiq, in other words, yeah. What else have you got? Then someone has to understand the, the 
the concept of la ilaha illallah. Okay, so knowledge. Knowledge. Okay. How many have you got? Three of them. Tawheed. Tawheed. Yeah, but la ilaha illallah illa illa is Tawheed. So we're asking, what do you need to have Tawheed? Uh, this table here then. Yeah, go on. You got one more? I'm thinking because Tawheed, we have to be patient because... Okay, good. Sober. Okay, so you need patience. But now I'm asking here, if you don't have patience, do you become a kafir? So that's the implication. Sorry, that's the implication. What do you need to say that in Ireland? Yeah, go on. Sincerity. You need sincerity. So that's really number five. So number three, sincerity. Anything else? Truthfulness. Truthfulness. Okay. Truthfulness yeah, but ha, you can't have belief to belief. What is belief? This is what we're asking. Oh. Mm -hmm. You can't say, um, in order to believe in light and light, I need to believe. So, uh, it's you're using the same word to divide itself. You need something mm -hmm. external. So, what is belief? That's what we're asking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What is belief? All right, so we've got five here so far, or well, four here so far. Yeah? Application. Application. Okay, so if you don't apply that in a lot, you're not Muslim? Yeah. Yeah? So without this, you will also become a kafir? Maybe. Yeah? Anything else? Yeah? Submission. Submission. Okay. Submission. Good. Anything else? This table here now? Intention. Intention. Intention, sincerity, kind of similar, isn't it? Yeah. Anything else? Mm. A certainty. A certainty, good, all right. What you mentioned is about anything is certain. Yeah. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we spoke about believing that there is a God in the first place, so they ask whether this is God. Yeah, but that's what we're asking. What is belief? So, so you can't say to believe is to believe. You know? No, as in. What does belief comprise of? So when you say you believe in God, what does that mean? It means, I have knowledge of Him, I have sincerity towards Him, I have truthfulness towards Him, I apply what He has told me to do, etc. Yeah? Love. Love. Are we done now? I think we might be done now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got more than I bargained for. I? I wasn't expecting nine. Maybe we can add a proof. Like proof, maybe. Okay. Uh, this is what the scholars have said. In another way of saying what you need is they've talked about the shurut or the conditions of la ilaha illallah. So now we've got knowledge. Without ilm, you would be ignorant. Without ilm, you, don't, you wouldn't even know if God exists or not. Sincerity, can you believe in la ilaha illallah and you don't actually believe in it? You're just saying it and you don't actually believe in it. That would not be possible. Following an application is similar. I would say following an application is the same thing. So if you say you believe in la ilaha illallah and you sit at home and you don't do anything about it, then it's kind of useless. Uh, truthfulness is here. So you can't not believe in it, then you won't be believing. You can't, be, you can't think that maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe there could be an element of doubt in it. Then that would not be belief that the brother was saying. Belief is to have firm conviction and then that leads on to the next one which is certainty which is the opposite of doubt and acceptance which is similar to submission and number one again should be number seven which is love therefore we have two extra ones without patience patience is not one of those conditions and tawfiq is not one of those conditions but tawfiq is a byproduct of all of this if you have this, Allah will give you the tawfiq. But you need to have that in the first place for you to say la ilaha illallah. What? Okay, so what's that? So now here we have truthfulness. So this is the topic that we're studying today. If you can open your muskhaf at page number 14, whether you've got it in English or in Arabic, and we have another exercise. So now we've got a little passage that we need to read in the Quran. Let's get it up here. Let's choose a first 
one. Surah Imran, chapter number three, ayah number. How do we get it? You can add another slash. Oh yeah, you can add another slash at the top uh, and do slash fourteen. What do you mean here? In the yeah. yeah. yeah but that's just going to be on fourteen, isn't it? But it will, it will bring a bit more under it as well if you get rid of the hash. Get rid of the hash. Just remove yeah. the hash. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you click continue as well. Excellent. Oh, you've got some of the experience here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now, <laughs> <laughs> truthfulness. What is the proof? Now here we have a, a little passage in the Quran where Allah is talking about uh, after talking about believing in the book and believing in all the books that came before us Allah then goes on to talking about the life of the dunya and it's not just coincidence, it's not completely random, there's a reason Allah says that the life of the dunya and the women, children and the wealth everything that people are preoccupied with is beautified for people. Zuya linnas. It's beautified for people. But Allah it says that all of that is just an enjoyment that's going to end in a little while. It's not permanent. And you don't know how long you have left with it. Whereas Allah has the best of return. And a return which is everlasting. Then in the next ayah. So Allah, what, what, what's the summary of this ayah here? You would say. What would you think is like a, a good way of just summarizing what 14 is saying? Yeah? Life in this world is temporary. Temporary. Fine. Good. It's temporary and the hereafter is not. Then Allah goes on to describe why the hereafter is not temporary. <clears throat> because Allah is saying then, shall I tell you something which is better than what is temporary here? Those people have iman and taqwa and fulfill all of this. They will have a garden. Is that right? Jannat. More than one garden. Gardens. Not one garden. They will have plenty of gardens. And underneath these gardens, there will be a river. One river. No. Plenty of rivers. And all of these are eternal. And they will have spouses and they will have the pleasure of their Lord. But who are these people? Who are these people who re realize the temporary nature of this dunya and work towards the permanency of the akhirah? Allah tells us in the next ayah. So it is only those people who say that, Oh Allah, our Lord, we believe in you with this. We have all of these within us. <coughs> so forgive us. So they're making, they're asking Allah that, look, in this dunya we are here. And we submit to you and we proclaim all of this to you. So forgive us and save us from the fire that you have created for those people who don't have this. So then who are these people? So now the next ayah. What are some of their characteristics? So like the brother was saying, patience really is something which is connected to Laila, but it's not exactly part of it. It comes before it. If you look at this ayah, it comes before it. So in order for you to get patience, and in order for you to get assistance, you need to have all of this. Once you've got all of this, then Allah describes what He will give to you. He'll give you sabr. He'll give you truthfulness. He'll give you obedience, He'll make you pious. And He'll give you the ability to forsake your desires, so that you can attain a, a higher place for yourself. And you will be able, you'll be given the tawfiq, to rectify yourself and ponder over your own mistakes. As-sabirin, sadaqeen, qanideen, wal-munfaqeena, wal-mustaghfirina, bil-ashar. Who are these people? Those people who witness and fulfill this criteria here. And Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the very next ayah that those people, wa'ulul ilm, qa'im al qist they are supported by the angels and then supported by Allah who witnesses to this himself. There's a connection, there's a very strong connection. And the more you have of this, the closer you will get to your Lord. And the closer you will get to his Jannah. And the promise. 
This is what a summary as to what the, some of the Mufassirun have said. I have to mention the good of the dunya and seeking the akhirah. Allah mentions the akhirah and talking about the pleasure that's within it. And then he mentions that there's only a certain group of people who are qualified to get his jannah. 16 and 17. Those people who believe and those people who have these characteristics. And the more you have of it, the closer you get to him. The more you have of it, the closer you get to, the stronger you become in this. And then this, the closer you get to this and this in the dunya and in the akhirah, your eternal abode will be higher. And these characteristics, sabr, siddh, qunut, steadfastness, nifaq, and istighfar. And some of the ulama have said that all of these are a prerequisite for another. You need to have sabr in order for you to become truthful. It's not the other way around. Once you have sabr, then you become truthful, then you will become obedient. Once you have sabr, and then you become truthful, and then you have obedience, then you will be able to fulfill what Allah wants from you and forego your own desires. And once you start doing that, then you will be in a stage of rectification and reflection over your own self. The stronger you have this, the stronger to lead you will have. So what is truthfulness? What do you think truthfulness is? How would you define truthfulness? Because that's what we're talking about today. It's here on the board. Somebody rightly pointed it out. Truthfulness. The chapter of truthfulness, Riyal Salihin. But what is truthfulness? What does it mean to be truthful to La ilaha illallah? It's defined. <laughs> I'm asking you, what do you think? It's defined here. Yeah. <laughs> what it says. Okay, to accept something that is factual. So you believe in La ilaha illallah and that is a fact for you. Uh, some of the ulama have added in believing in the unseen. So even though you've not seen it, you believe in it. It's, it's factual, again, it's factual. Whether it's seen or unseen. And truthfulness necessitates that you have no doubt in it. Okay? So this is what we're leading into today about truthfulness. This is what we want to be said about those people who have truthfulness. The word uh, sidq is grammatically intensive for which indicates a high level of belief. It's not just Iman, it's a higher level of that. So a lot of people say La ilaha illallah, but they're kind of relaxed on some of these issues. When it comes to factual, then maybe, you know, they say, yeah, we believe in the hereafter, but they don't really act and work towards it. It doesn't really affect them. Therefore, their level of truthfulness is compromised. It's not gone, but it's weak. Or believing in the unseen. Yeah, many people, they will sit there happily watch a movie with, you know, created animals and special effects and all these things. Where, in actual fact, our book tells us about supernatural beings and natural, supernatural beings that we can't even imagine. An angel that, from his earlobe to his shoulders, 500 years in distance. And people need to watch and things to be entertained and to have their, you know, the imagination fulfilled so that can also be compromised and that can also be compromised because some people are thinking okay well I do believe in the Quran but I'm not sure about certain things yeah it's from Allah and I believe in it but so truthfulness means all of these things so Imam al to be said that if it's come from Allah and you know it's from Allah and his messenger you accept it wholeheartedly and you know that this is better than whatever you think and then this person once he has said he confirms it with his actions. And with it, so it's, it's three parts. Yes. It's internal belief. Yeah, so let's get this one here. Belief. And then we have actions. And then we have statements. So the stronger your level of Iman in Siddh and truthfulness, the stronger your level of belief, and then the stronger level of the action, the stronger level of the statements. And it was said that they, the Siddiqun, are the best of the followers after the Prophets. So if you want to know who are going to be the highest level, the Yom Qiyamah, after the Prophets, Imam al be said, it will not be anyone except those people who have Siddiq. 
how do we get it? It's not coincidental that it's chapter number four. Some of the ulama have said that obviously you need a khlas, you need to have, as we saw in the ayat of uh, Al-Imran, you need to have sabr, and you need to have tawbah, and you need to have ikhlas. Being steadfast on the above equals truthfulness. Without that, there could be an element of kadib. The opposite of truthfulness is denial. So that's why it leads them nicely to being chapter number four. Imam An-Nawi uh, brings the first ayah. Does anybody remember this ayah? It came in one of the chapters that came before. What's the context of this ayah here? Huh? A company, yes. Yes, maybe. After, after the story of uh, the three... Uh... MashaAllah, excellent. So after the story... What's what happening there? After the story of who, sorry? Ka'b ibn Malik. Ka'b ibn Malik and the others that were with him. Okay, so let's go down. And Allah Jalla wa ala then goes on talking about the three people that were left behind in the battle of Tabuk. And it was as if the whole world had come upon them. Why? Because they were completely abandoned. Prophet didn't give them given salam or anything. And then Allah Jalla wa ala says, Ka'bi bin Malik, and those with you, we've accepted your tawbah, so be with those people who are truthful. Don't be with, who else? The munafiq one. So this is the commandment. Here we have a list of characteristics for the people who are going to Jannah. And again, this is similar to what we saw in Surah Imran. Islam, Iman, obedience, and then what? Truthfulness. What is truthfulness? Again? To accept. Accept. And uh, believe, uh, which is believe, definitely accept and act, up, uh, act upon it. action and say it. And not have any doubt in it. No. So telling and the truth. wholeheartedly accepting it. Telling the truth is part of truthfulness. So, so yes, of course. But here we're talking about in the sense of acceptance. In La ilaha illallah. Mm. If you were to be untruthful, as we will see, if you were to be untruthful towards the creation, mm. it wouldn't mean that you have compromised La ilaha illallah directly, but what you have done is you weakened your level of Iman. Why? Because you have not fulfilled believing in the unseen properly. So if I say to you something and I'm lying to you, and I know I'm lying to you, am I believing in the unseen mm. by acting irresponsibly, by, by sinning, by being insincere? Mm. I'm, not, I'm not conscious of the fact when I'm doing that, that Allah is going to hold me to account. So, yes, in a way, yes, mm. but what we're talking about tasdeek, is... About tasdeek. Tasdeek. Mm. About, you know, yeah. firm conviction of... Like, mm. Next time, okay, so this now here comes in the context of giving an opposite meaning that Imam al Nawi is trying to trying to portray here. Who are these people? Had they been truthful, it would be better for them. Who are these people? They are the hypocrites. I was talking about them in Surah Muhammad that had they had good words and had obedience and had steadfastness then being truthful to Allah would have been better for them. 47.21 <clears throat> So not only do we see <clears throat> that, yes, you could end up sinning without truthfulness, as we saw in the first incident. We also learn that one, the more, the stronger your level of truthfulness, the stronger in Iman and Islam, and khushu, and your ability to think about other people, and preserving your private parts, and preserving other people's honor, all of that will be an implication of it. And then what will happen? Allah will uh, enable you to remember him and then Allah will give you his Jannah and his Mughfir and his pardon. That's the second ayah from a different tangent. But from a third tangent here is that it separates you from the Munafiq one. And it gives you the opposite characteristics. <coughs> Obedience, 
statement, good, you know, goodly statements, and being steadfast. All of that leads to truthfulness. The weaker it becomes, the closer you go towards the other scale. Hadith number 54, 54 the Prophet said that truthfulness leads to piety. And bir yahdi al jannah. That truthfulness leads to bir piety, and piety leads to jannah. So again, it starts off with a central point here. Like uh, Ustad Raid was saying, that if you have truthfulness towards Allah, then you will be pious. If, you, if this is compromised, then you won't be pious with other people. And if you make that something which is habitual, then how are you going to get there? How? Is it possible? A man persists in speaking, so look here, look, persists. It has to be consistency, it has to be reflection, it has to be uh, sincerity, it has to be all of these things, knowledge, all of these things. Until Allah writes it down that he is a truthful person. Al-Fujur, or Al-Kadhib Yahdi Al-Fujur. Lying will lead you towards vice, something which is bad. And something bad will lead you to the hellfire. And a person continues to lie until he is written with Allah. As a liar. Now, again, if you look at what we've taken so far from these chapters, is we've got a class which we've talked about it being an action and self-reflection. Then this led to tawbah, which is repentance and getting closer. This well then led to sabr, which is what we talked about last week: obedience, disobedience, and decree. The three types, and all of this then now leads to either one of these paths. The stronger all of this becomes, then your path to either one of these ways becomes, or the weaker it becomes, it leads to the other way. So now the Prophet is saying in this hadith that the stronger it becomes, the stronger these characteristics. The weaker it becomes, then the stronger those characteristics. So everybody now is choosing their own path. Hadith number 55, the Prophet said, Leave that what makes you doubt uh, for what that doesn't make you doubt. And truthfulness is a peace, is a tranquility, is a sense of comfortable nature in yourself. And kadib rib, uh, falseness, is a doubt, something which doesn't settle with you. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable for the person who believes. The point here is that. The more truthful you have, the, the more truthfulness you have, the more certain you will become. <clears throat> and the more you will be supported in your life, and the more life will become easier for you. Because you're living in a sense of truthfulness. You're living in a sense of submission and certainty and love. Hadith 56 is the Hadith of Abu Sufyan, who reported in the course of Jesus' narration when he went to the emperor of Rome. The Quraysh, they had enough of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they went to Rome. And they said, help us to get rid of this guy. So the emperor of Rome didn't agree with him. He asked him some, some questions first. And he said, and in describing the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu and what he was calling to, he was saying that he's calling us only to worship Allah and that you don't associate partners with him. You give up the way, the religion of your ancestors. Stop being backward. Stop being, you know, blindly following other people. Think about where you have come from, where you are going to go. And he also commands us to pray the Salat. And after that, as if it's the third pillar, to be truthful, to observe modesty and to strengthen ties of kinship. So what we learn from this is that truthfulness can be a statement, it can be a belief, it can be a statement, it can also be an action. You can actually be true in your action. Belief, I mean, we've talked about that just recently, just now, it's to be true internally, and it's the opposite of shirk and it's the opposite of nifaq. The, the stronger your ikhlas, the stronger your tawheed becomes, the more stronger you become in sirk. What do you saw in the eye and so on? Statement is like uh, Ustad Raj said, is that a person will begin to become more factual once he has that. So once he's more factual in his statements, in his afkar, in his recitation of the Quran, and, and his connection with Allah, in his belief, then his statements with Allah will become stronger. If your statements with Allah become stronger, what happens? 
is that your statements with the creation will become stronger. And this will conform to what you internally believe. Some of the ulama have said, the Prophet ﷺ, for example, said that when you smile to the face of your, your a believer, then it's a form of sadaqah. And one of the things that they've took from that is that when you smile towards your believer, believing brother, it can only be a sadaqah when you have that level of sincerity and sit from inside. If you are smiling towards him, but inside you, you are harboring something else, and that's not a sadaqah. Mm -hmm. You can smile, you can laugh, you can give him money, you can do whatever you want with him, but it won't be a sadaqah. So the belief will necessitate statement and action. You will be sincere towards him, you will speak nicely about him, you will encourage him, you will give him good advice, not bad advice. It would be the opposite of lying, it would be the opposite of backbiting. That's in statement and also in action. A person's action, actions conform to his internal. And it's the opposite, as uh, some of the have said, that your sin and your bid'ah and your kufr and your shirk, all of these are lying by action. <clears throat> Number 57, Prophet Wasallam said, He who asks for martyrdom, Allah will raise him the state of status and give him that status of being a martyr, even if he dies on his bed. <clears throat> one of the companions, he died as a martyr but and wanted to be buried in Medina at the same time when he made that as a dua and Allah gave it to him. But also what we learn is that truthfulness and the opposite of truthfulness is the point where you die and that's where you see it. So Allah is saying here that those people who are highest and because of the level of truthfulness will be in everlasting bliss. But those people who lied to themselves and lied internally and externally and lied to their Lord will be in a state of jahim. Tawfiq at that moment. I think we've said this before. If you look at what Fir'aun did when he was trying to, when he was in, when he was in, when he was facing death, he panicked, and he didn't know what to say. But how many people have been there, and they were taken in the sense of ease and and comfort and tranquility because they had all of these aspects. They knew that the Naim was waiting for them. Here now we have a long hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is talking about Yusha alayhi salam. Prophet one of the earlier prophets sent out on expedition and he was told that you can only go into that expedition as long as the sun doesn't set. So what happened was is that he went out on that expedition to fight and the sun was beginning to set. So what he did is he made dua and he told the sun, he made dua to Allah but he's commanding the sun also, hold back because Allah has commanded me to do something. And I'm making dua that you hold back so I can fulfill my command. Another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said that the sun has not been suspended in the sky for no one except for this person who made this dua, Yusha. The sun stayed so that he can fulfill what Allah told him to do before the sun had set. But then what happened was is that when they went into the city and they took over, they were spoiled of war that some people had taken in an improper manner. So then they told the Prophet that somebody, somebody's taken something, they've stolen something, it's not, they didn't do it properly. And then he started asking and they started saying, well, the thief is amongst us and every individual of the tribe must swear an allegiance to me. So he's speaking to the different tribes, etc. Hands of two or three people stuck to his hand and he said the thief is among you. So he's, when he's giving the bayah to the different people that were with him, the different you know, pockets of people, different families, he would now be able to tell who had the thief amongst them. And then when he got to a group of people that he knew that these people had what had been stolen and this man uncovered a head's like worth of a cow's head like worth of gold. So what he was commanded to do, this Nabi, was to place the gold down on the ground 
and the fire came from the sky and it devoured it, completely destroyed that gold. The Prophet ﷺ said, spoils of war were not allowed for those people before us, but it became something which was legislated in our Sharia. Nice story, but where's the Sidq in this? When it comes to the <laughs> spoils. The spoils, yes. Okay, so he wasn't being truthful. He started to steal. But if we take it a step back one more, and look at what we said here, is that when you start differing, it all goes back really, it goes back to this, but when you start differing in the command of your Prophet, and you start accepting sin, and you start innovating, then everything starts becoming compromised. And it will affect everyone. It will affect the innocent, it will affect everyone. This is what the Ummah is going through today. Everyone looks at Muslims with the sense of suspicion. They don't trust them, they're not really accepted because of the act of few who clearly don't have truthfulness. What we learn from this is that the sun was paused for a person in the sky. But what about a prophet who the moon was split for? Which one do you think is greater? Which one do you think is greater? Which one would you be more marvelled by if you saw? The sun is just there in the sky, it's not moving. Wait, this is a great sight, don't get me wrong, it's from the miracles of Allah. <laughs> but the sun literally split so that people could see it. Split. Booty wasn't written for them, but booty was written for us as a mercy, as a rahmah, as an honour. So if this was their prophet, and we have the best of prophets, and if this was their ummah, and we have the best of ummah, then how would it be if we were truthful? How would it be if we were not truthful? What would be the consequence? And perhaps this is why Imam Nawi has put this here. So he's saying that, look, look what happened to people before you. Allah gave to their prophet and Allah gave to their ummah. Allah has given to your prophet and Allah has given to your ummah. But if you compromise that and you messed up for yourself through the lack of truthfulness, then you've only got yourself to blame. They were just had a cow's worth of gold that was taken away from them and a whole hukum was taken away from them. What would happen to you? Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said the highest level of sincerity is that of a Siddiq, a person who has unwavering truthfulness. Everything is factual. He acts as he can see the unseen and believes firmly in the unseen. And what that then does for him is it perfects his level of submission to the messenger. That's one of the biggest things we learn from this story here. And then what happens is that it becomes accompanied by sincerity towards the one who sent him. Who's the one who sent him? Allah Jalla wa ala. Like we were saying before, it's a series. It starts off from inside, it affects your action, it affects your, your speech and your, and, your, and your actions as well. It's like a person who smokes. A person who smokes, what happens? His internal gets corrupted, he might end up with cancer. Nobody can see that. He himself can't see that. His speech and his breath becomes foul and he might even end up burning your clothes or something like that. And it's the same thing with this, isn't it? That if you have corruption, internally it will go out, it will affect your speech. It will, it will be seen on your speech, it will be seen in your action. But the stronger it is, then the opposite. Hadith 59 is the hadith of uh, Hakim ibn Hizam. Reported that the Messenger Sallallahu said that if a person gets into a business transaction with somebody, they have the right to annul and to you know, lose any interest in that transaction as long as they are together. But if I say to this brother, okay, now look here, I want to sell this to you for one pound, and you, he agrees, the transaction is done, and then we split. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that as long as both parties have been truthful with one another, and clear, that's what it says here, they will be blessed in their transaction. But if I'm concealing something from you, if it's a fake product, there's no ink in there, uh, it could be red, but I'm selling in black, for example, and he's giving me fake money, for example, <coughs> then any kind of blessing will be eliminated from this. This is what Imam Noah has brought as the last hadith when it comes to talking about truthfulness. What this teaches us is that once you have fulfilled all of this, 
then you can only become united and have truthfulness towards your brother if all of the other things have been met. How can you be united as an ummah? How can you have rectification? How can you want good for your brother, what you want for yourself? How can you forgive and how can you forego your own desires and your own rights in order to make your brother happy? Some of the ulama have said that truthfulness towards your brother is you get happy when he gets happy and you actually get hurt and sad when he gets sad. So if this is a business transaction where you feel that you can rip your brother off, then imagine anything else that you have inside. We are called to be truthful in actions in our transactions. So now here, as a summary, the, the, the chapter of truthfulness is very short, so we're going to do another one after this as well. We've now looked at what is truthfulness, is to believe a firm con conviction that what Allah has told us is factual. What we know of the unseen is factual, and we don't have any doubt in any of those things. Why is it so important? Why is having said so important? Because you need it to fulfill your la ilaha illallah. But you need it to get a connection to Allah. What are some of the steps that you can do to attain it? It's threefold. It's internal, it's on your speech, and it's external. But it also includes ikhlas, it also includes tawbah, it also includes sabr. So a person might want to lie, but he needs to restrain himself. A person might want to do something bad, but in truthfulness towards his Lord, towards his brother, towards sincerity towards them, he will refrain. But from the great, greatest of virtues, Allah says in the Quran, in his Quran, in Ayah, and Surah Nisa, that those people who obey Allah and his Messenger, that in the Akhirah, they will be in an extreme level of bliss and grace, Allah says here. Who will they be with in the Akhirah? Who do you want to be with in the Akhirah? In the depths of the fire or in the peak of the Jannah? It's up to you. But if you obey, then you will be with the Prophets and you will be with the Siddiqi and you will be with the martyrs and you will be with the pious. Now look at here. We have different levels and degrees. And Imam Sa'di here is saying that this is the lowest level of Jannah. Those people who are pious. Some of the Salaf said that whenever we saw Imam Ahmad, we used to remember Allah for one month. When we just saw the man, we used to think, we used to be taken so back by his manners, by his etiquette, by the way he used to speak to us, by the way he used to smile, uh, you know, the benefits that he used to give us. We used to just remember him for one month. We used to think, hey, remember that time, you know, and I learned this from him. And I... This is the lowest level of the Salihin. Not Imam Ahmad, inshallah, it's those people who are affected. Now you might see a brother in here who's got a big beard, or a sister's wearing hijab, and he prays five times. That's the lowest level. Now, unfortunately, within society, they've become like the highest level. But there's a level higher above that, and those, those people who strove for the sake of Allah, to the extent that Allah took their lives away in that state, they sacrifice absolutely everything. And we know that the shaheed, obviously everybody knows what a shaheed is and unfortunately people see the shaheed as being somebody who's gone out there and done something wrong. But the shaheed is a person who has sacrificed his life for the sake of the religion. That doesn't necessarily mean fighting. It could be anything. But the point here is, is that the siddiqeen are higher than this one and this one. They're actually higher. So the more you perfect this, the more you will get closer to the Nabi and the more you get closer to Allah. And the more you'll be elevated above those other people that we look in society think, yeah, that guy is the guy that I want to be like. How do you do that? How do you do that without understanding? Without understanding the previous chapters that we've looked at also. Imam Sadi said the Siddiqun are those who have reached the highest level of Iman. Righteous deeds, one second, beneficial knowledge and true certainty. He's given you four characteristics. Tawheed, Iman, Ikhlas. Following up with that with actions. You're not lazy. You're driven. You're motivated. Nobody needs to motivate you enough than what Allah says in His book. But you need to have, like we've said, all of these things there, and you need to try and increase in it. And try and, you know, perfect yourself and look where your mistakes are and move forward. Yeah, I mean, on a, on a daily basis, for example, how many of us, we can be truthful to ourselves here, 
How many of us wake up Salat al-Fajr and they just think, you know what, five more minutes. And you just turn around. The next time you wake up, it's like nine o'clock, you've missed it. How many times has that happened? Everybody is inside. Everybody has flaws. Everybody gets tired. You could have been, you know, had a very busy week. You really just shattered and then you woke up and it happens to everyone. And my point here is there's certain people, their eyes wake up and the first thing they think about is, is it time now? Do I need to go? Am I ready? I'm ready. You don't even need to think about it. You know, some people, they, the Prophet Sallam used to recite the ayat of Surah Amrani, he used to wake up, rub his eyes, he used to recite the ayat of pondering and making dhikr of Allah, and he used to go, Khas. You know, think to yourself, you wake up Salat al-Fajr, and Allah says that this is a, a, this is a, a Salat, but the angels are going to be there, and they're going to be listening to the recitation. This is a Salat, not for the Munafiqun. This is a Salat that the Prophet Sallallahu said, you walk to the Masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Nur Tam Yawm al -Qiyam. you'll have a complete light of those people who come to the Masjid in darkness, Yawm al -Qiyam. This is what will increase you in your level of Sidq. But you need to have that knowledge, you need to have that level of sincerity and submission. And that will increase your righteous deeds. Once you do that, you will increase more in this. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah and others from the ulama have said, which one do you think? Who is more virtuous on the scale of piety and reward, a scholar or a shaheed? A genuine shaheed. A scholar, why? Because that's something, even the knowledge that can help other people. Shaheed does the same thing. Because... Uh, He's helped people, he's gone and he's, you know, helped fight oppression, whatever he's done. He maybe sacrificed his wealth. Look at, look at the reward of the shuhada, it's, it's uncomparable if you think about some of the virtues. But like you said, Barakallahu Fikum, is that knowledge is uncomparable. And included in the Siddiqeen are those people who are increasing in these characteristics here. The stronger you have in Iman, the stronger you have in deeds. The stronger you have an ilm, all of this will increase you in certainty and it will increase you in your level above just being pious, above just being from the martyrs. I'm just saying just because in comparison, the Siddiqun are going to be those next to the Anbiya. Because yeah, so Shada can probably, anyone can get it, even doesn't need to be a scholar, just... It's possible, yeah. Right? But Siddiqun is... Uh, yeah, I think that's what the other brothers are saying. Well. Yeah, so I mean, the point here is... <coughs> Sidq will lead you to a higher station, yeah, Habib. Sheikh, I was going to ask, you said that um, you don't have to necessarily die in conflict or combat in regards yeah. to being a martyr. Yeah. Could you give other examples? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi described that others, there are different types of shuhada. If you die, for example, uh, at sea, if you died a cause of fire, if you died because of uh, a disease in your stomach, there's different types of shuhada, but the greatest type of shaheed is the one obviously who dies for the sake of Allah. But again here, what is the sake of Allah? As the ulama have said that jihad is not just fighting. Jihad is defined in seeking to make Allah's word the highest. That's what jihad is. So imagine now, for example, the Prophet said in another hadith, that a person who goes out seeking ilm, he goes out and he comes back, fi sabilillah. Once he's gone, he come back. So imagine you've gone Medina, one year you want to stay there. Whilst you were there, you were in the sake of Allah. If you died, but even that, you could die as a shaheed. It's very possible. Okay. This is truthfulness. The next chapter, again, it's not very big, is the chapter of al muraqaba And I've translated that as being consciousness. And this is a synonym, which is a similar word, to al-ihsan, as we see in the hadith of Jibreel. And we're going to get on that in a minute. <coughs> Imam Nawi brings the ayah Allah watches you when you stand. Stand for what? Yeah. Stand for prayer. Consciousness, the highest level, the highest level of connection is when you're standing in front of your Lord. And He sees you while you are alternating, making ruku and sujood. Why would Allah mention these <coughs> places? If they are not something which is noble, if it is not something which is important. Yeah? So now, if you perfect this, 
whilst you are standing in front of him, then imagine what he could do for the rest of your life. Another ayah, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا كُنْتُمْ He is with you wherever you are and he knows everything that you are doing. The point here, if you realize that Allah is watching you and he has knowledge over you, then you will be conscious of that fact. This is again talking about consciousness. So the first one here is talking about consciousness in Salat. As we know in another hadith, Prophet ﷺ said that if your Salat is perfect, then everything else will be perfect. If your Salat is corrupt, then everything else will be corrupt. Your life. So this is that why now the second one is just talking about your life on a daily basis. The Salah is given more importance here. Inna la yakhfa alayhi shayin fil ardi wa la fi sama. There is nothing, not even one aspect of the universe. And now we know to the extent of telescopes and all these things how expansive the universe is. There is not even a little thing that is hidden from Allah. Shayin at all, not minuscule. So imagine what about you? Imagine, think about it, there's 20, 30 people in this room. Allah knows exactly what we are thinking right now and what we will be thinking in the next few moments and our actions individually. And not only that, it's going to be written down. Not only that, he's going to call you to account and ask you. In the Rabbaka Labir Mirsad, after Allah talks about those people who are oppressive, he's saying that he's ever watchful over them. And that Allah knows the corruption of our eyes and what our hearts conceal. So these ayat have been handpicked really to show you that Allah is ever watching over you and is going to hold you to account. And every single one of us is bound to slip. But it's only those people who don't take this realization or those people who are not going to be successful. When you are happy with your level of oppression, when you're happy with your level of injustice to yourself and to other people, when you're happy with your level of uh, lack of tawbah, lack of motivation, motivation, lack of rectification, lack of any change, you're just happy in desires and sin, then there's a problem. If you are changing and if you are seeking to become better, then not only will he aid you to have a connection with him, so will you, when you stand, you are actually standing, being conscious of the fact that you are speaking to your Lord and you are saying his words. But you are also conscious in your daily basis, in your daily lives, in your routine. So you look at these ayats, it's as if it's been split. Hadith number 60, the well-known hadith of Jibreel, where there was a beautiful man, he came, he was extremely white clothes and extremely black hair, and he came and he asked Prophet Sallallahu what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told him about these things, and he told him about what is going to come of the, uh, of the, of the, the Day of Judgment. But here, is the bit where what we are really concerned about Absolutely. and in actual fact even before that because now what we learn is that we have Islam and everybody who says La ilaha illallah has Islam even if they haven't perfected this a person can still be a Muslim if he doesn't fully love Allah there could be elements of shirk, minor shirk going on in with him or certainty going on with him it's possible but that is the lowest form then a person becomes stronger in all of this and he becomes stronger in his iman but there's a level that will make you excel above all of this what is that is the ihsan and muraqaba and ihsan is the same thing it is to worship allah as if you see him now ihsan is of two types as if you see him as if you see him but if you can't get there then to realize and this is consciousness realize that he sees you which one's stronger what obviously that one? one is strong yeah. but you can still be an ihsan it's not all loss you can still be an ihsan as long as you are having a level of degree of consciousness about you therefore muraqaba can only be gained after a series of strengthening and purification you, you don't just wake up like that <laughs> You can't. It's not possible. Ibn al rahimahullah said, Muraqaba can only be gained. Now, how can you realize that Allah is watching over you so that you can be in the best of behavior? I mean, there's certain things that we won't do amongst family members. If your mother is present, if your father is present, it's not the same way you would be if you're with your mates. Yeah? But then why are we using that level of 
split personality and change when we should always have and seek to have the best of akhlaq, the best of statements, the best of actions. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, is to constantly have knowledge of your Lord in every given situation. What does Allah want from me now? When I'm in the bathroom, when I'm having my food, when I'm speaking to people, when I'm praying my salat. This will then determine your strength of consciousness as to whether Allah is watching over you or not, internally, externally. A muraqabah, like I said, is of two levels. The highest one is as if you can see Allah, even though you can't see Him, but you are conscious of the fact that there is something there. So when you say Allahu Akbar, you know you can't see Him, you know that. But you can feel the presence. But if you can't, then at least you know that you are standing there knowing that something is watching over you. That's in Salah, they imagine about every other aspect of your life. Hadith number 61, and these are some of the hadith that you find in Al-Rahim, a lot of these. Pay Allah wherever you are, do good deeds after bad deeds. If you do a bad deed, if you slip in consciousness, what do you follow up with? More bad deeds? So, good deeds. Good deeds. Yeah, so I went to the cinema. Uh, let's just forget it, let's just go have some shisha now. And let's go <laughs> listen to music. I've already done that bad one. And people think like that. People actually think like that. They, they can't go to the masjid because they're not pious enough. I can't grow a beard because I'm not pious enough. I can't do certain things because I'm not pious. That is all from shaitan because the Prophet said, if you've done a bad deed, you've realized you've done a bad deed, what are you going to do now? Split roads. Are you going to do more bad deeds and let shaitan win and say, no, I'm not pious enough to go down that road. Let me just carry on. Or do you do good? This is taqwa. The former, because what you do when you make that situation, when you make that decision, you will have your sins wiped out. Allah will give you tawfiq to behave better and become a better person. So what we learn from this hadith is how to get a level of consciousness. How do we get that constant state to the best of your ability? Because now here we have ability. Prophet didn't say that you don't do bad deeds. Consciousness means no bad deeds. That's not possible. But what it means is that you have a consciousness. You have, you know, uh, a yearning to become better. Yeah. That means you need to have taqwa, that means you need to follow up good deeds on a hope chance that you meet Allah and that the right side is going to be heavier. Because you don't know which one's going to tip it. And that you treat people in the best of ways. Did he say, behave decently towards Muslims? Uh, everyone. Even if the person doesn't like you, and if you don't like him, you treat them with the level of respect but how do we get this Ibn Qayyim said muraqaba can only be gained if you firmly understand especially five names and attributes of Allah it's in Madari. he said Allah is al-Raqib Allah is al-Hafiz number one al-Raqib number two al-Hafiz number three al-Alim number four al-Sami' and number five al-Basir one of the Mashaikh said that one of the best ways that you can increase your Iman in a way like no other is when you study the names and attributes of Allah. Maybe after your study, maybe you could do something like this. That you will find there is so much khair and barakah in studying the names of Allah. And what that will do is it will make you a better person. As we can see here, if you just understand five out of the limitless names and attributes of Allah, it can help you to become conscious of who Allah is in your daily life. Whoever grasps these five, then he has attained the objective of consciousness. Activity now. Uh, we're going to get you to do it in your groups, but you just shut them out. Let's match them. So we've got five definitions and we've got five names. Definition number one, the one who observes everything, the one... Okay, so now remember... Each name could have more than one meaning. So if there's a comma, then there's a separate part. So the one who observes everything, and the one who tests, and the one who protects. That's number one. Where do you think that one goes? The one who observes everything. Okay, so Al-Basir, does that mean he tests? And the one who protects? Maybe, yeah, maybe. That's a good one. Maybe. It's possible, but it's not. What did you say? Al-Hafid. The one who observes, 
the one who tests, Hafiz is a test. Hif. <coughs> Uh, Alim, Alim. No, the no. one who observes. Excellent. Number one is a raqib, the one who observes. Raqaba, muraqaba. Your raqib is the one who observes everything. But Raqib is also the one who tests. And Raqib is also the one who protects. Consciousness. Is that when you realize that Allah is observing you and that He is the one who is testing you in your daily life and you're going through the state of shukr and sabr, shukr and sabr. And if you do that, He will protect you. Okay, number two. The one who protects is awliya, specific. The one who protects the creation, general. And nothing escapes Him. Al Hafiz. Did I just ruin that? You did, yeah, thank you. Uh, Al Hafiz is the one who protects. Now, there's specific protection and there's general protection. Specific is for the awliya, general is for the rest of the creation, but nothing escapes him. What? Al Hafiz, nothing escapes him, meaning he protects and he's going to bring everything on Yom Qiyamah without anything being lost. Okay, number three is number three. No, number three is Al Alim, the knower of all. So he knows everything. Uh, how they are and how they would be if they had were to occur. So you could imagine now, for example, if I went this way and I went that way, I ended up going this way. But Allah knows what is going to happen if you go towards the right. But He would know also what would happen if you went to the left and what would happen as a consequence of that, even though that actually didn't even happen. Ever. The one who hears, responds, witnesses, and protects. That's the meaning of Samir. So when you say Allah is a Samir, and Samir means to, to hear. Samir Allah, what does that mean when we say it in the, in the Salah every day? It means He hears us, so we say Rabbana al -Kalhamd. It also means that He responds, Rabbana al -Kalhamd. Respond to us, I'm saying it to you, Ya Allah. I'm standing here in front of you with consciousness. Listen to my dua and respond to me. And He witnesses and He protects. That's the meaning of Samir. And Al-Basir is the one who sees you. He is going to account for you. And Basir also means that he is going to protect you. Now, if you look at all of this and you incorporate it really well, this is what Nuqayim is saying. You incorporate this in your Iman, in your actions, in your statements, in, your, in, in every aspect of your life, then you would have attained the objective. You have a high level of consciousness. You have a high level of protection. You have a high level of uh, connection with Allah. The next hadith is hadith number 62, where the Prophet ﷺ said to uh, one of his companions, Oh boy, I'm going to teach you about certain words. Be mindful of Allah, and Allah will be mindful of you. If you ask, then ask Allah alone. And then the hadith goes on. But the, the point here is, is that if you are mindful of Allah, then He will be mindful of you. Nuqayim again. In this amazing book, Madarij, he said, understanding the concept of Muqaraba is ex extremely well, will enable you to be protected. How? Because what happens is when you protect Allah's rights and that consciousness, Allah will protect yours. When you mention Allah's name, Allah mentions your name. When you talk about Allah in the gathering, Allah is talking about every single one of us right now above his arsh to the angels by name. That's happening right now. Understanding the concept of miracle extreme that will enable you to be protected, protected in all of your actions. So whoever is mindful of Allah in the private, you will have that programming. We're doing this right now. Are you going to go home and just spoil it all? Or are you going to try and keep it up? If you've got consciousness, you will try and keep it up. Hadith number 63, Anas. You indulge in bad actions which are really insignificant for you guys. More than a speck of a hair, by the time the Rasul, they were considered as being destroying sin for your Ummah. Yeah, a speck of a hair for us to just wave it away. The time of the Prophet, they used to see it as something that could destroy your Iman completely. Hadith number 64. Verily, Allah the Exalted becomes angry and his anger is provoked when a person does what Allah has declared as unlawful. Because Allah is jealous over us. He's jealous over us, over our own selves. We might want to do something bad, 
But Allah wants us not to do that something bad. When you do that something bad, Allah gets disappointed and angered and and has more patience with us than we have with ourselves. Perhaps he's going to come back. Perhaps he's going to make tawbah. Perhaps he will get to the Jannah. A wise man is the one who calls himself to account and refrains from doing the evil uh, and does noble deeds to benefit him in the hereafter. And the foolish person is the one who subdues himself to his temptations and desires and seeks from Allah the fulfillment of his vain desires. He carries on living life and seeking from Allah whether he admits it or not. He wakes up every day and he goes to the shop to buy cigarettes or whatever he's doing, seeking provision from Allah whether he realizes it or not that's what he is doing. Foolishness, isn't it? But the point as well here is that the foolish person is the one who subdues himself. That's very important because now we're living in a society where sin is just thrown at you, left, right and centre. And for you to have sober and put that shield up is very difficult. Some people don't even have a shield. And they say, no, okay, khalas, that's it. I'm not going to smoke again. I'm not going to do that harm thing again. But that moment, as soon as he's flashed in front of them, they grab it. The sabr is gone. The shield of that sabr is gone because it's become very, very hard. And the Prophet is saying here that the person who doesn't strive with that level of consciousness and sabr and tawbah and khalas is the person who is destroying himself. Slowly. It's from the excellence of the believer of his Islam is to leave whatever that doesn't concern him. Now these are hadith obviously it's quite explanatory. But I wanted to use this statement which I thought was very nice. Kind of talks about consciousness and sin as a concept. Because these three, four hadith are talking about consciousness and your weakness. When your consciousness goes down, then your shield has gone down and you just fall. And you do things which you might end up regretting. You might not even end up regretting because of your lack of consciousness. You don't ponder on those things. You just think, okay, I like doing this thing. I know it's bad, but I just like doing it. And I won't even think about it afterwards. I won't think about making tawbah. I won't think about how to give it up. Sahal al-Tustari, he was the third generation, he was one of the Salaf, the Imams of the Salaf. Whoever makes the Sirat narrow for himself in the dunya, then it will be wide for him in the hereafter. Whoever makes the Sirat wide for himself in the dunya, then it will be narrow for him in the hereafter. Does that make sense? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean to you, Ibrahim? Consciousness, you stick to the path. You fight off all those things that are coming towards your way, despite it off, for the sake of Islam, for the sake of your Iman, for the sake of pleasing Allah. What happens in the Akhirah? The Sirat. What is the Sirat? I can't even draw it. It's thinner than that, and it's sharper than a sword. And it's a bridge that runs across Jahannam. You won't be able to draw it. You know why? How wide is Jahannam? We know for, for a fact that was a rock that was thrown 17 years later it landed at the bottom. And the companions got to hear it and they said, what was that tremendous noise you saw? He said it was a rock that was thrown 17 years ago and it just landed now. I can't draw the line. And it's even thinner than that. It's thinner than a hair. And it's sharper than a sword. And every single people on Yom al Qiyamah, the earth, what will happen to the earth? The earth will be destroyed. We will be brought to stand on a level plane. That level plane, when everybody has been decided what's going to happen, and that's when the arsh will be there, or the most best will be, and the sun will be above people's heads. The arsh will be here, say for example, and there will be a great deal of people standing there, and there will be people drowning in their sweat. What's going to happen then is that also this will be destroyed also. And the Prophet ﷺ said the whole of creation from Adam until the last man will be held at the Sirat. United and gathered at the Sirat. And at the Sirat, one by one, they will be asked to go past it. There's nobody that's not going to go past it. Below you is Jahannam. In front of you is a sword, uh, it's a bridge, sharper than a sword. Thinner than a hair. How are you going to pass that? Sahal al-Tustari has said that this is the way that you can pass it. If you make the dunya narrow for yourself, then that sirat will be made wide for you. 
you will pass it comfortably. If the dunya is expansive for you, there's no level of consciousness, there's no level of ikhwas, there's no tawbah, there's no sabr, there's absolutely nothing, there's no uh, self-reflection, there's no accounting to yourself, then this will be even thinner than a hair. May Allah protect us and our families. 65 is the incident, and I think this is the last of these. Yes, this is the last of these. Of an incident. Now, when I actually studied this, is in Kitab al I believe I studied this with one of the scholars, and he spent the whole lesson talking about this hadith. And there's so many benefits, and it's really nice to explain this. Basically, it goes like this there were three men from Bani Israel, and one man was a leper. What's a leper? It's got skin problems. It's erratic, very, very. It's worse than eczema. A lot of people suffer from that. Skin problems. So an angel came down to him and he said, You've got a really bad skin problem. What is there something that you would like? Because I want my skin to go back. So from the barakah of Allah, he was given good skin. And it was made, you know, really nice colour, it was really healthy. And then he asked him, the angel asked him, What do you want? Is there anything else that you want? And he goes to him, Yeah, I want some wealth, you know, I want some stuff. And I like camels. So what the angel gave to him was a pregnant sheikh, a pregnant wife, because then they will keep reproducing. And then he left him, made the offering, goes, hold on, I'll see you later. He's helped him with his skin problem, and he's given him a camel. An angel came to another man from Bani Israel, and this man was bold. So he goes to him, what do you want? He goes, I want my hair back. Really bad. He made the offering, for him, and he got his hair back. And then he asked him, same question, what do you want? He goes, I want some cows. First man, cows, second man, cows. Cows, yeah, okay, here's the cow. Here's your hair back, and there's the cow. The pregnant cow, khalas. Me du'a for him, may Allah give you barakah in it. Ma'asalam. Maybe I'll never see you again, maybe I will. Third man was blind. Me du'a for him, restored his eyes. And then he goes to him, what do you want? He goes, I want some sheep. Gave him a pregnant sheep, me du'a for him, and he went. Now, as time went by, they became shepherds because they multiplied. The angel made the offering. What happened? Baraka. Now, here's the test. These valleys became filled with these three people. One guy had a lot of cows, another guy had a lot of camels, another guy had a lot of sheep. This man came to him and he goes to him. Now, the angel came back to him, sorry. The angel came back to him in the shape of a poor man, a needy man, a dependent man. And he said to him, Can you give me one of your camels? I'm very, very poor. I'm sorry, I can't help you. So he goes, are you that man that used to have, you know, the leprosy? Were not you that person that used to have, you know, all of these things? I recognize you. Are not you that man? He goes, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I inherited this from my generations, my fathers. Leave me alone. <laughs> Go away. So the angel made the eye now. Look at this now. First, he gave up a barakah. If you fail the test of consciousness, the du'a was against him. If you are telling a lie, may Allah return you to how you were before. Because Allah answers his du'a. He answered his du'a in the first time. A bold man, same thing. Leave me alone, man. This is mine. What are you talking about? I can't give you anything. Sorry. Again, if you're lying, the blind man. Because I need to give you... I, I, I'm, I'm poor. Can you give me something? So he goes to him. Yes, you can take what you want. Then he said to him, yes, I was. Weren't you that blind man that used to live in this? Yes, I was that blind man. But Allah gave me my eyesight back. And, and you can take whatever you want. I swear by Allah that I shall not argue with you today to return anything that you took. As I give it for the sake of Allah. Take what you want. So the angel said, it was just a test. Calm down, you can keep your sheep, keep your property, and you have passed. Allah is pleased with you, and Allah is displeased with your two other friends. What are some of the morals? I'm asking you now, what are some of the morals that you get from this? Truthfulness. Truthfulness. Okay, but here is Morocco. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, so what do we get from that? Two people, all three of them were in a desperate state, but two people failed the test of consciousness, but only one did. One moment passed. Anything else? Morals, 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 what do you get from this? Although this is why you're lying. So sometimes um, when you need him, he gives you what you want. And if you test over it, you 
Okay, you will be tested. Good. And the test now is between Sabar and Shukr, isn't it? Because the first state was Sabar. The second state is Shukr. How do you give Shukr? Is being truthfulness and being conscious that Allah is the one who gave it to you and you're going to return it back for the sake of Allah. Okay? So we all will be tested. Uh, so right, what did you say? Consciousness. Okay, for some people they lose consciousness. Consciousness. Anything else? Yeah? Everything is given by Allah can also be taken away. Okay, so um, fr- okay, so I'll just say from and back to Allah. Okay? Yes? Don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Okay, good. <laughs> Don't be greedy. Be thankful. Shukr. Huh? Shukr. Shukr. Okay, so I'll say shukr and sabar. Your state will not move from those two. Yeah? Anything else? We've kind of got all the morals that we wanted. Okay, these are some of the things that I was thinking about. <laughs> Everyone will be tested, it's also there. The parable is in threes. Why is it in threes? Usually, we find parables in the Quran of threes. Three men in the cave, three men. Why do we find it in threes? Threes, because Allah loves winter. And threes also because we need the middle guy. The guy in the middle is the one who is conscious. The guy in the middle is the one who is thankful. The guy in the middle is the one who is truthful. Between two extremes. These people were not prophets. What do I mean by that? These people were not prophets. They were from Bani Israel. They were normal people. But they were not prophets. What do I mean by that? An angel can come to you and test you. Do you know that? An angel can come to you and test you. How do you know? How do you know? It might not even be an angel. It might not even be an angel. How do you know? How do you know when you are being tested or not? How do you know when you're going to pass or not without that level of consciousness? A person could come to you who could be very, very poor. And you just, forget this guy. These people are more important. And you drop your guard of consciousness. You fail. It could be an angel. It might not be an angel. Blessings are from Allah. Some tests are superficial. There's leprosy, there's blind, and then there's bold. Some people exaggerate their problem. Some people just want to look good. Why? Because of the lack of consciousness. Humility comes when the test is worse. Which one is the worst one? Arguably, leprosy might be bad. But one of the mashayikh said that the person who is blind has no one to help him at all. So this is the worst test. When you are tested in a very, very bad way, it makes you very, very humble. It makes you realize the justice of Allah over you. So even Josie Rahimullah said that the more oppressed you are, the more justice of Allah you realize. The less oppression and the more comfortable your life is, or the lack of consciousness you have, then it's easy for you to be distracted from that one, taken away from realizing the justice of Allah. Humility comes with the worst of the test. Camels are harsh and sheep are soft. Yeah? The point here is not the kind of diet that you lead, it's the kind of indulgences that you want to get yourself into. The first guy, he was greedy. The first guy was being the best of camels. You know, a camel is worth, even now, some of them fetch millions in Saudi Arabia. More than cars, more than even houses, some of them. This person wanted the indulgence one. Give me the best of what The poor man, the blind man, goes, look, just give me something which is beneficial for me. I can live my life and I can just carry on. Simple. Allah likes that we can, when we give something, we do it properly and with extra. Where's the proof for that? Yes, but the angel, he came to him and he goes to him, what do you want? Even before that, he goes, what's your problem? Let me help you. Helped him. Not only did he help him, can I help support you and make you even better? Give me a camel. I'll give you a camel that is pregnant. 
three things you gave to him, and then the fourth thing he made dua for barakah. And all of that was found to be correct. He came back, after a little time, the whole valley was full. He was still in good health, he still had the original camel, he still had the reproduction going on, and the barakah was given to him. And that happened to all of them. And what we also learn from this is that, especially in the time that we're living in right now, Allah is telling us to plan ahead. Think about where you're going, but the best form of planning the best kind of planning, economically or not, is consciousness. Not giving thanks will lead to your downfall. Whether you realize it or not, it will lead to your downfall. Just like the brother was saying here, shukr and sabr, if you don't have that, you will fall. Whether it's today or tomorrow, Allah knows best. Allah is patient, but He is thankful. Those people who disobeyed and rejected the angel, did Allah could have just stricken them straight away, wouldn't it? Allah gave it to them. Allah gave them four or five, many blessings that we, we don't even know of. But Allah could have taken them, but He was patient. Allah doesn't care about the dunya. Why? Because He is patient. But we also learn from His patience, He doesn't care about the dunya. You can come on the day of judgment, middle or under the Zahaba. All the way to that day, they will come on the day of judgment, they will want to give the whole earth equivalent in gold to save them from the hellfire. Will that be accepted from them? No. The whole earth equivalent in gold, that's not even possible. But if they could, they will say, Oh Allah, we'll give this as a sacrifice for you, save us from the hellfire. It doesn't care about the dunya. You could have a valley full of camels, you can have a valley full of cows, you can have a valley full of sheep, all of that put together, Allah doesn't care about it. Allah cares about your consciousness. Then he said to him, Keep your sheep. Keep the barakah, you have passed the test. Allah is pleased with you. That is what Allah wants. People like to argue about the dunya, and they, but they don't have the same zeal for the akhirah. That's my camel. What are you talking about? That's my car. My father gave it to me. If only had that zeal for the akhirah. It's easy to have muraqabah and then lose it. When they're in the state of leprosy, when they're in the state of boldness, when they're in the state of uh, blindness, I'm, I'm needy, please help me, the angel. How can I help you? Okay, make dua for me. Okay, if you can give me a camel, I'll have a camel as well. Morakab is gone. Moments later. Being superficial and heavy in indulgences will make you attain or even lose Morakab. And again, this is something that we're living in today. It's very easy for you to become superficial and heavy in indulgences. All about phones, food, clothes, all of these things. And these are just some of the things that we wanted to say. As a summary now of al muraqaba and maybe even Sidq, is that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, is that understanding the concept of muraqaba extremely well will enable you to be protected and it will help you to become programmed in the private. And the public ask Allah to make this beneficial for us all. Excuse me for being uh, extensive again. And I ask Allah to give us life so that we can continue this amazing program of Salihin next week. Thank you. 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 Thank you.